So, good evening, everyone. I hope you're still alive. <laughs> okay, go. Um, so, because uh, symmetry is at the heart of universe, symmetry is obviously at the heart of the interaction between uh, light and matter. And so, obviously, at the heart of nonlinear optics. And so, it's exactly the purpose of uh, this uh, lecture. Uh, I will try to show you how symmetry uh, acts uh, in nonlinear optics. And it will be also the opportunity for me to give you some uh, tools of tensor algebra and uh, to show you how groups theory uh, can help. So it's a nice program, no? Isn't it? So here is the uh, outline of my talk. I will begin with a small introduction. Then I will move on electric susceptibility tensors and polarizations, field tensor and effective coefficient, by refringence phase matching, so it's BPM, and angular quasi-phase matching Locky topologies, the effective coefficient versus BPM or AQPM Locky, the symmetry, and I will finish with the, the symmetry analysis of isotropic media under strain. So you see these five parts after the introduction are uh, the five uh, aspects uh, I have identified where symmetry uh, plays a crucial uh, role. Okay, so the introduction. So you know that the electric field, the electronic polarization, the different orders of the electric susceptibility are polar tensors. I will define the, the word polar uh, the slide after. And so in uh, a 3D space, uh, these tensors are uh, described by uh, matrices uh, having three to n coefficients. So E and P are real uh, vectors. So they are rank one tensor, that, that is to say three pair one uh, matrix, and so three uh, independent coefficients in the general case. The first order electric susceptibility is a rank two tensor, so nine coefficients. Chi 2 a rank 3 tensor, 27 coefficients, and chi 3 a rank 4 tensor, it means that we will have 81 independent uh, coefficients. So now let's move on uh, the part devoted to electric susceptibility tensor and polarizations. And so don't be afraid, I'm, I am not going to give you a, a lecture on crystallography. But we, we need some, some, some basic tools. So you know that the 3D crystals belong to 32 crystal class. We speak also of uh, uh, class, classes of uh, symmetry orientation or point group. So three uh, words for the same. So 32 crystal classes. Uh, defined it by the combination of several symmetry operators characterized by their transformation matrix A. So I will show you here the different symmetry operators that are combined. So the identity, so any object with uh, any shape has the identity as a symmetry uh, operator. Uh, the two axes, three axes, four axes, six axes. So a two axes means so you see here that you have a symmetry uh, after a rotation of uh, pi. So two means, so an operator n means that you have a symmetry after a rotation of two pi over n. So when n is equal to two, you have a symmetry by a rotation uh, of pi. And so uh, 2 pi over 3, 2 pi over 4, that is to say pi over 2, and so on. And you have here the inversion, so who is the, which is the, the sixth uh, uh, operators here. 
So the inversion, you know very well what is it. So you see here that you have, so here you have the inversion center and you have symmetry according to this center. And now if you combine these four operators with the inversion, you create these four new uh, symmetry operators, uh, so minus two axes. So these axes are called um, roto inversion axes. And so minus two correspond to a rotation of pi and then the inversion. And you see here that it is equivalent to a mirror. So a mirror plane is in fact a roto of, uh, inversion axis uh, of degree two. And so minus three, minus four, and minus six. So now, if you try to combine all these symmetry axes together, so you have a huge number of possibility of combinations, and if you uh, open a book of groups theory, uh, you see that you can have only 32 possible combinations. And these 32 combinations constitute the 32 crystal classes, and they are divided into seven crystal, uh, symmetry, uh, crystal symmetry, a symmetry class, uh, the triclinic, so in, in tr the, tri the, the two triclinic classes are the uh, cl class one minus one, so it's the, the basic level of the symmetry, monoclinic classes, uh, M, two, two over M, and so on. So triclinic system, monoclinic, orthorhombic, tetragonal, hexagonal, trigonal, and cubic. Seven uh, symmetry classes. And so the 32 uh, crystal classes are, uh, can be listed in these uh, seven uh, families. Okay, so when we uh, make nonlinear optics with crystals, so we have to see uh, in which uh, crystal class, with which crystal class we are going to, to work. Okay, so now, we are going to see that uh, the difference, so the, the, the fact that, that the crystals uh, have uh, uh, given uh, symmetry operators, uh, so uh, is going to influence the form of the matrix of chi 1, chi 2, chi, chi 3. So my purpose here is completely uh, general. So you can apply it to any kind of uh, physical uh, properties, mechanical, uh, wh what you want. So it's, it's fully general. And uh, for that purpose, so we use a very powerful principle, the principle of Neumann, uh, which stipulates that any property of a medium has to be invariant by all the symmetry operators of this uh, medium. And we can find a, a, and bring a, a more general formulation in terms of group theory, which is that the symmetry group of the medium is a subgroup of the property. So it means that the property can have a higher degree of symmetry than the medium. I will come back to that uh, later on. Okay, so now, how can we apply this uh, Neumann uh, principle? So, we do like this. The tensor of the property is invariant by all the symmetry operators of the medium, which gives, so you know that a physical property is characterized by a tensor. So in our case, it is chi one, chi two, chi three. Uh, and so if the properties is invariant by the symmetry operators, it means that the tensor has to be invariant by uh, these symmetry operators. And so here is the corresponding tensor uh, equations. So T prime uh, Y, J, K, L, so is a uh, transformation transformed of tensor T by the symmetry operator A. So 
T prime is equal to the summation over M N O P. So you have here the product of A Y M A J N A K O L L P multiplied and so on multiplied by T M N O P. And so here the number of Cartesian indices correspond directly to the number of uh, to, to, to the rank of the uh, tensor. So here is a transformation of tensor T by operation A, and Neumann's principle stipulates that this quantity has to be equal to the initial element, so uh, to T, Y, J, K, L, and so on. Um, these uh, uh, indices are relative to uh, a true rectangular frame, so we are going to see that for our purpose in, in optics or non-linear non optics, so this frame will be uh, the uh, dielectric uh, frame. Um, you have also to know that uh, the transformation of uh, a polar tensor uh, is equivalent to the transformation of the product of n Cartesian coordinates. We will see that uh, later. Okay, so for uh, in, in, in uh, the case of uh, optics, so here is uh, the, the Neumann principle written for chi 1. So chi 1, so it's a wrong two tensor, so two Cartesian indices. So chi 1 prime equal to this uh, has to be equal to chi 1 uh, yg. Um, so if this prop property uh, exists, you have uh, this property has to fulfill this equality. The same for chi 2, it's a rank 3 tensor, so we have to apply three times the operation uh, A, and for, and for, chi, chi, th uh, for chi 2, and for chi 3, so four times the application of the symmetry operators. And by doing this, so it's, it's very heavy because you take a given crystal class, imagine you want to, uh, uh, to work on chi 2, so you take each of the 32 crystal class, classes, and then you take, you write this equation for all the symmetry operators of the crystal class. So it's very, very heavy, and there is no code to do that, so you have to do that using your head and uh, a pen. Uh, and doing this, we see uh, at first that we uh, have a reduction. So, so we speak, we, uh, th this work is called reduction of tensor. Uh, it, reduction means that in fact, doing this, we uh, see that we decrease we decrease the number of independent coefficients of the uh, tensors. And when we do that, what we see, so we begin by chi 1, what we see, we see that uh, the 32 crystal classes can be divided into three forms of uh, the chi 1 matrices, which defines the three optical classes uh, we, we discussed about that uh, today, yesterday. Uh, so the isotropic uh, class, the uniaxial class, and the biaxial uh, class. And I uh, uh, remind uh, that uh, these, the matrices, the, uh, the matrix chi one has to be written in the dielectric frame. It is a frame. Uh, so sometimes it's difficult to find this frame. So it is a frame in which chi 1 is diagonal. Okay, so, so now I am just, uh, I'm just going to give you uh, the, to list the crystal class, classes without uh, any uh, details. So I, uh, uh, we saw uh, yesterday, so uh, in the case of the isotropic class, so it corresponds to the five cubic crystal classes, these five ones, and for them, 
So the uh, uh, three elements uh, of uh, the uh, chi-1 tensor are uh, equal. Uh, and as I saw, so it's the same slide than uh, yesterday. So we know, we saw that the, uh, the corresponding index surface is a one layer uh, sphere. And it's exactly the same for uh, glass, gas, and uh, liquids. Other crystal classes uh, have uh, this form of matrix uh, with two elements, two equal uh, elements. Uh, so these classes are the trigonal classes, tetragonal classes, and the tetragonal classes and hexagonal uh, classes. The index surface is described by a two-layer uh, object, uh, described by a sphere and an ellipsoid. So I am not going to spend too much time on that. We saw that yesterday. And finally, the biaxial class corresponding to the triclinic, monoclinic, and orthorhombic uh, system. And in that case, so the three uh, main value of the first uh, order uh, electric susceptibility are uh, equal. Okay. And the complex, the, the index surface, so is uh, this one. So it's a little bit more uh, complicated than in the case of uniaxial crystals. And we, we, we see yesterday all the implications uh, it has in the, 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 the configuration of the fields, uh, the interacting uh, fields. But we are going to go uh, deeper uh, on that. Okay, so now the symmetry of chi 2. And so you saw uh, in the talk uh, uh, given by uh, Marty, by Majid, and I spoke to that also uh, yesterday, that no chi 2 in a central symmetrical uh, crystal. So how does it work? Now we have the Neumann's principle, so we are going to, to see if it works or not. So here, I, uh, um, you have the X, Y, Z uh, axis of the dielectric frame. And on right, you have the transformation of this frame by the inversion. So you obtain minus X, minus Y, and minus, uh, minus Z, so my, here drawing uh, here. And remember, I told you that the, uh, the transformation of a polar, ah, I forgot to tell you what is a polar tensor. Yes. Sorry. It is a definition of the polar tensor. There is another kind of tensor, axial tensor. The magnetic field is an axial tensor. And it is defined by another transformation relation. You have to multiply here this by the determinant of the matrix A. It means that for the roto inversion operators, for which the determinant of the matrix is minus one, so you have here a minus one. And so it is the two kinds of tensors you have in nature, axial and polar. In non-inner optics, uh, if we don't uh, speak, if we work in a non-magnetic uh, medium, we work, we are working with polar tensor only. Okay, so now we move here, and remember that I told you that in the case of a polar tensor, the transformation of the tensor is equivalent to the transformation of the product of the Cartesian coordinates. So here, in that case, for if we want to very simply have the, transform the transformed of uh, chi 2 y j k, we have to consider the transformation of the Cartesian coordinates y, j, k. And y, j, k is transformed into minus y, minus j, minus k. 
and the product is equal to minus y j k. You are okay. And so, so minus k uh, chi two y j k is a transformation of chi two y j k. And Neumann uh, principle stipulates that this piece has to be equal to this piece. And the, un the only way for that is that chi 2 y j k equal zero. And so very simply, you can demonstrate using Neumann's principle that uh, chi 2 uh, in a central symmetrical medium all the chi 2 coefficients are equal to zero. And it's the case for all though, these uh, central symmetrical uh, crystal classes. Okay, so uh, I gave you this slide. So you do this work, so you, 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 you can play to, to, to this game, so it's, uh, you will have fun. And uh, I did that many times because you are Never you are sure that you are right. And, and so you, 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 you do the game. Uh, you actually doubt yourself. Exactly, yes. And I, I'm proud to say I chose to trust people like you. <laughs> but, but I am not sure. But, but <laughs> so it is in these international tables for crystallography. Um, so, okay, you see that for the uh, uh, crystal classes with the less degree of symmetry, we have 27 elements, so we have all the elements, and for the cubic classes, you are uh, the smallest number of independent coefficients. And you see here, because this confusion is uh, often done, that for cubic classes that are isotropic classes from the uh, refractive index point of view, you have these three classes that are non-central symmetrical. Okay, huh? you can be cubic and no central symmetrical. Uh, gallium arsenide is in that case. Okay, symmetry of chi three. So if you uh, apply uh, the same things, so here we have an odd product of minus things, and so it gives uh, something positive. So uh, this element is transformed into this that has to be equal to this, but it is equal to this, so everything is fine. And so we can deduce that in uh, that all the crystal class, the central symmetrical ones and the non-central symmetrical ones can have non-zero chi-3 uh, elements. So good news. And you have here this. And one more time, uh, Bob, I did the job. Uh, probably with some headaches. I don't remember, but uh, I, uh, I like that kind of things. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody knows this. The very first papers in the linear optics have been wrong, and all the authors just kept copying uh, over and over and over again. And then finally, about 20 years ago, one of the original authors mm. came out and said, I have something to tell you. <laughs> so, <laughs> Uh, I had the same problems, so it's why I decided to, to, to take time on that. <laughs> okay, um, so now, so we saw the influence of symmetry on the form of the tensors chi1, chi2, and chi3. Another aspect where symmetry is very important uh, is when uh, you want to um, uh, mod model uh, the uh, electric susceptibility. So you have to make the way from the microscopic aspect to the macroscopic uh, aspect. And uh, so here I take a very simple model. You will have uh, the lectures of Valérie Vignard and Isabelle Le Dourac on more sophisticated models. But here I just want to focus on symmetry aspect and this bond charge model is uh, very nice for that because we see the things. It's not an ab initio uh, model, and so we, we, we can see the physics. And um, so the macroscopic electric susceptibility is defined by the sum of the microscopic susceptibilities over the unit cell uh, of the crystal. And so for that, 
we have to define a tensor of microscopic susceptibility, so alpha mu, for each bond mu expressed in its own frame, u mu, v mu, w mu. So one more time, it's a little bit heavy. So you have here, for example, uh, the uh, chemical bond uh, mu, and you see the uh, true rectangular uh, frame, uh, u v w, where w is along the axis of uh, the, uh, the bond. And um, usually, uh, one take only the component of the macroscopic, uh, microscopic susceptibility along this. But probably uh, Isabelle uh, Ledourac will show you, I don't know if, if she is going to do that, but she worked on that a long time ago and she defined also the polarizability of the chemical bond uh, in all the, all the directions. But for our purpose, and it is uh, sufficient, we are going to uh, consider only the nonlinearity along the, uh, the bond uh, axis. And XYZ, XYZ, one more time, is the uh, optical uh, frame. Okay, and so for chi-1, what we have, so this summation has to be done. It is an oriented sum, in fact, obviously. So we have to take into account the orientation of each bond. And so you have here the cosine director of the bond. And chi-1 is given by this expression. So it's a summation sum over the mu bonds of this, where alpha mu 1 is the, fir the, the first order electric susceptibility uh, of bond uh, mu. Uh, so you have here, so the cosine uh, director. So one more time, you find that it is a wrong two tensor. So you have here to have two pieces. So you have to make a little bit uh, solid state uh, physics here. I'm not going to go uh, in details. Uh, it is expressed uh, uh, by uh, using the plasma frequency, the conduction bond factor, the average energy gap. So uh, the, it is given by this, this relation, and you, you will find uh, the, the, the detail of this model in the, the nice paper of uh, uh, Levine. Uh, so you see here that we have an oriented, uh, an oriented sum. For chi 2 same, uh, same game, uh, I'm not going to go, uh, so, so you, you apply, you have three cosine directors uh, here. We see that uh, alpha 2 uh, depends on alpha 1. Um, so you have the details in this paper. And we did the job uh, in 99 for uh, chi 3. Uh, so uh, same things. We make the sum of the, uh, the, the microscopic uh, susceptibility. So now, imagine that we have, we want to conceive the, the, the best uh, chi 2 material in the world. And so we are very good chemists, so we know exactly the chemical bonds who have the, the, the bigger alpha 2 uh, tensor, the bigger hyperpolarizability. And imagine that we have two kinds of uh, chemical bonds in this crystal, bonds mu A uh, and bonds mu B. The macroscopic susceptibility, chi 2, will be given by the summation, the oriented, the oriented uh, sum of uh, the things we saw previously for bonds mu A and bonds mu B, where G here correspond to the product of the cosine directors. But now imagine, okay, so you grow the crystal, um, you make, uh, you study the, the crystal structure using X-rays, and you see that, in fact, the bonds of mu B, so remember, mu B is very strong. I don't know how many uh, picometer per volt, but imagine that it is very strong. But this mu bond, mu B bonds, constitute a centrosymmetrical group, 
like this, for example, you have the yellow atom, the blue atoms here. So you see that, and it is a, a planar uh, structure, so you see that at this, at the gravity center here, you have also an inversion center. So it means, using Neumann principles, it means that the G factor will be nil. So chi 2 will be equal only, will have only the contribution of bonds mu A. It's a shame because mu A is very small and mu B was very strong. So we lost. <laughs> And so we have to uh, find a new crystals. So you see how symmetry is very important uh, for people who make uh, material engineering. Fourth point where symmetry is very important, the calculation, more not the symmetry, because the symmetry things were done previously. Now I am going to show you, to give you some uh, tensor algebra. And so I'm going to show you how to calculate the linear and nonlinear polarizations, so in single crystals or in QPM uh, structures. Uh, let's begin with uh, P1. So you know this uh, famous constitutive relation of linear optics, P1 equal epsilon zero K1 E. So, so now we have to identify who is who. So Epsilon zero is a scalar, so it is a, a rank zero tensor. Chi one is a rank two tensor, and E is a rank one tensor. Here, there is, it is one dot, because on, right, on the right of this sign, it is a rank one tensor. So I put one point, one dot. And this dot, it is a contracted product. And when you contract a tensor of rank M with a tensor of rank N, you find a tensor of rank M minus N. That is to say here, two minus one equal one. We are very happy because on, on the left, we have a rank one tensor. So we, we are very happy. Uh, you know, the, the scalar product you know, a equal u scalar v. It's, uh, it's the uh, contracted product between two rank one tensor. So it gives a rank one minus one equals zero uh, tensor, a scalar. It's why we speak about a scalar tensor, a scalar product. But the general terminology for that is a, a contracted Product. So the scalar product is a particular case of a contracted product. Okay, so now, and so I recommend you to do that kind of job uh, anytime you can do that because it helps. Sometimes in help, you see, for example, that uh, you uh, have made a mistake if you have not a coherence between the rank of the tensor. Uh, on the left and on the right of the equality. Okay, so now if we want to calculate uh, this uh, P1 polarization, so we have to write this, the same tensorial equations by, but by uh, explicitating uh, the Cartesian indices. So it is Py equal epsilon zero sum over j, k one yj, ej. And so if now you write the corresponding matricial equation, you have here uh, this. And you see here, so don't, uh, don't forget that we work on the uh, dielectric frame. So you see, so, so you have these very simple uh, equ equations. And so you see here, so it's finally the, the first manifestation of anisotropy, that in the isotropic class, these three elements are equal, so that P1 is collinear with E. But you see that in uniaxial and biaxial classes, because these elements are different, at least one is, uh, is different, 
they are different. So in that case, P1 is not collinear with E. It means that the uh, deformation of the uh, valency uh, electron orbitals uh, is not in the same direction than the applied optical field. It is a manifestation of anisotropy, and you can see that directly at the level of uh, the constitutive uh, equation. For uh, chi 2, so now I put here two dots because on the right I have here the tensorial product of two rank one tensors. And when you make this the, the, the tensorial products of a tensor of rank M by a tensor of rank N, you obtain a tensor of rank M plus N. So it means here that we have a rank two tensor. So I put two dots for the contracted uh, product. Chi two is a rank three tensor. I make the contracted product of a rank three with a rank two. I obtain a rank three minus two equal one. Okay, I'm not wrong. Uh, this equation uh, seems good from the tensor point of view. Here is a corresponding uh, equation with the Cartesian indices, uh, knowing that, so here it appears Ej omega 1 multiplied by Ek plus or minus omega 2, and don't forget that we have this very useful uh, equality. So now, how does work the uh, matricial, uh, the matrix uh, equation? So here, we have the pi 2 vector, so it is a, a column matrix, px, py, pz. We have here the 3 pair 9 chi 2 matrix, and here the, uh, the column matrix uh, of corresponding to the uh, tensor uh, product. So at this level, you have to take care of the sequence of writing of these elements, and the, so the horizontal sequence and the vertical sequence here. Obviously, you have to uh, be compatible. So you see here that the first index, uh, the, the first index x, y, z correspond to here the uh, three Cartesian coordinates of the uh, column uh, matrix, and after the x, x, y, y, z, z, and so on, you see that it is e, x, e, 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 x, e, y, e, y, e, z, e, z, so you have the corresponding y, y here, and so on. So in fact, it's very simple, but you have to take care and to have compatible compatibility between the two uh, matrices. And for example, in the case of uh, MM2, you have this general expression uh, for, uh, for P2. And I advise you, I recommend you to, um, when you have to make such a calculations, don't use the contracted notation. Use the, the, the non-contracted notation and, and you, you, you will succeed. It's not... Uh, a sufficient uh, condition, but... Uh... <coughs> okay, the third order polarization, same thing, so now you have understood. Three dots here, and so on and so on. The corresponding equation with the Cartesian indices. And so uh, I have not uh, uh, drawn uh, the nice tensors with the 81 uh, coefficients. And so we, we, we need uh, A0 uh, format uh, to do that. Okay, so now you know how to make these calculations. And one more time, here it is illustrated uh, with crystal optics, but uh, you can also apply that uh, if you, for any kind of uh, properties. Uh, now, uh, the symmetry acts also, so Marty, uh, this afternoon, uh, evocated the fact that by reversing the structure, we reverse the spontaneous polarization. But what is the following of the story if we want to understand 
what is the consequence of the reverse of the spontaneous polarization. And we know that we have inversion of the sign of chi 2. Why? So for that, if you want to understand that, you have to uh, uh, know that chi 2 is given by this uh, algebraic sum. And obviously, if you rotate the crystal, you are going to rotate any bonds. And when you are going to make the summations, if you found plus in this direction, and if you tilt the crystal by pi, you are going to have, so you will have minus, sign minus for chi 2. So the spontaneous polarization is a thing, but the manifestation of the, this structure uh, the reversal acts at the level of the nonlinear uh, coefficients. And here, imagine we take, uh, and it's the case of lithium noibate, for example, when we, 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 we want to tilt the domains. In fact, there is a rotation around the x-axis. So it means that a piece of the pipeline is oriented like this, and the following piece is orienting like this. You have tilting the crystal around the x-axis. And you apply Neumann principle. You transform each element here in the elements uh, after a rotation of pi. And you see, if you take, you take so the 27 coefficient of chi 2, you are going to find only these 3, 6, 12, so 14 coefficients. These 14 coefficients see their sign change by the rotation by pi of the structure. Only 14 coefficients among the 27 coefficients. And Marty said that uh, for QPM, it's very uh, nice to work with chi 2 z, 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 so because effectively we can change the sign of uh, chi 2 z, z, z. And when you have changed the, the, this sign, you can make this periodical reset of pi. Uh, you know, you see here, imagine, so this is based to the fact that exponential plus or minus j pi is equal to minus 1. So imagine you have a domain plus chi 2. Here is the electronic, the, 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 the quadratic polarization written here. So we have plus chi 2 here. The following coherence length, it is minus chi 2 because the structure is reversed. And uh, so here in the pi 2 uh, polarization, you write here a minus chi 2. And we know, thanks to that, that is minus chi 2. This minus 1 here can be put here, putting plus or minus pi in the phase of the polarization. It is exactly like this that it works. So you see that by changing the sign of chi 2, you introduce uh, a, a dephasing of pi in the electronic polarization. And so, if you do that periodically, you have this pi reset at each coherence length, uh, and you have QPM. Okay, so third part, field tensor and effective uh, coefficient. Uh, let's begin with uh, three-wave interactions. So you remember, I told you here that a very important uh, uh, parameter uh, that appeared in uh, the coupled wave equations was the effective coefficients given by the scalar product of the uh, radiated electric field, the unique vector of the radiated electric field by this here, uh, this piece, chi 2, contracted with A3, A2, and so on, according to ABDP uh, symmetry. So you see here that you have a mixing of linear properties, that is to say, because you have the polarization of the fields, and 
nonlinear properties, the Chi2 tensor. You had this mixing. And long time ago, I proposed a new formalism and I proposed to write the effective coefficient by these tensorial equations. F2 contracted by chi2. I put three dots here because chi2 is a rank three tensor. And F2 is equal to what? Simply to the tensor product of the three interacting electric fields. So here, so this is fully equivalent to this. So you see here that you have the contracted product between two tensors of same rungs. So we, we, we are working with something which is more symmetrical. Maybe we are on the way of truth. I don't know. We'll see. And um, so just the, the, the same uh, analysis than previously. So OK, to, to be sure that we are not wrong. F2 is a rank 3 tensor, chi2 a rank 3 tensor. So if we make the contracted product, we obtained a rank 3 minus 3 equals 0. We obtain a scalar. OK, we are right. So why this new writing is interesting? It's interesting because here you see that we have, we, now we are working with two tensors, the light tensor, F2, and the matter tensor, chi2. But don't forget with the, so the light tensor being built from the unit electric field vectors of the interacting waves. But don't forget that the, the matter, the medium, is not absent at this level because you know that the electric field depends on the index surface. So it's not a pure light tensor, but it is, uh, it is real, uh, really linked uh, to light. So the light tensor and the matter tensor, and by making the contracted product of these two quantities, you obtain the effective coefficient, that is to say, uh, the strength of the coupling. So now, if you uh, uh, calculate this coefficient here, so it, it's not difficult. Theta and phi are the angle of spherical coordinates of the unit vector, of the uh, wave vector. And so, according to the index surface, you calculate the, um, you calculate the orientation of the different electric field vectors and you multiply uh, these, uh, and you obtain these things. So for example, in the case of uniaxial crystals and in the XZ or YZ planes of biaxial crystals, you obtain these nice tensors. So it, it can look, uh, look like uh, uh, a chi-2 tensor, but it's also a 3 per 9 tensor because it is a rank 3 tensor, but here, this tensor is a light tensor. And so, and so you see that we have a connection equality, or this, is, this element is equal to minus this element, and so on. Some elements are equal to 0. So uh, these are real tensor, but field uh, tensor. And the, the magnitudes of the field tensor coefficient depend on the direction of propagation. So at each direction of propagation, you have a given uh, form of the uh, F2 tensor. So one very interesting point is uh, that this formalism is, uh, allows us to identify forbidden classes, crystal classes, for nonlinear optics, for chi2, for quadratic optics. So we start uh, writing this, chi2 equal uh, F2 contracted with uh, chi2. So we know that F2 depends on the configuration of polarization. So it can be written for a phase matching direction or any kind of direction. It's not necessarily a phase matching direction. 
So F2 depends on the configuration of polarization, and chi2 depends on the symmetry of matter. We saw uh, the Neumann principle, and so uh, we know that it depends on the uh, symmetry operators in the medium. And sometimes, chi2 is equal to zero for any direction of, of propagation. So imagine you are the guy who conceived uh, the fantastic uh, chi2 uh, crystal. You find the good chemical bonds. You have the good symmetry for uh, the group uh, of, of these bonds. You find phase matching, so it's absolutely marvelous. But you find nothing, and you find nothing because the effective coefficient is nil at any direction, phase matching direction. And so it happens for the crystal classes D4, so D4 and D6, a tetragonal class and an hexagonal class, for uh, one half of the possible uh, configuration of polarization for phase matching for OOE configurations. And it happens also for uh, the crystal class C4V and C6V for EEO configurations. So you know, it's, it's very difficult to find the good crystals and, and, and to find the phase matching uh, conditions. So imagine here for these crystal classes, you have only one half of the possibilities. So maybe uh, D4 uh, is a marvelous crystal and it has uh, EEO uh, config uh, configuration of polarization, but you know that you have uh, two times less uh, probability to find a phase matching in such a crystal. So it appears very nicely using this. It, it is not completely formulated. I have to work a little more to formulate uh, this. I have some ideas for that. So it's not completely uh, done. Okay, for the four wave uh, uh, interactions, Exactly the same thing. So here I put so chi the chi three effective coefficient chi three is given by this contracted product. So I put four dots here because chi three is the wrong four tensor. Same story, and here very nice. Uh, so it looks like electronic, you know, uh, circuit. Um, So I hope that there is no bug in the circuit. <laughs> and uh, we also uh, can uh, uh, de uh, determine uh, four crystal classes for which uh, these configurations of polarization are uh, forbidden. So one more time, these crystal classes are not necessarily the best one, but maybe one of them is a fantastic, you, you, maybe you will find one day a marvelous crystal belonging to one of these classes, but you know that you can have only one half uh, of the possibility for the configuration of polarization. Okay, so now let's move on phase matching and quasi-phase matching Loki topologies. And I will begin with birefringent phase matching, BPM, so you uh, see here something that I uh, shown you, uh, I, uh, I showed it you yesterday. So the type one, two, and three uh, cones of uh, phase matching. So the phase matching directions in a uniaxial, here I, I, I take the example of a uniaxial. I begin with uniaxial crystal. So as I told you yesterday, the phase matching direction describe cones uh, surrounded the z-axis, which is the optical axis, that is to say the direction joining the two umbilics of the index surface. And uh, so there is uh, these cones, for example, for uh, the, the, the same, uh, the same um, triplet here, you can have these three cones, that is to say, uh, an infinity uh, of uh, directions allowing type one, type two, type three. If you are lucky, you have all the, the, the three types 
that uh, is uh, loaded. Okay, so why do we have this topology? We can ask the question. So for that, we are going uh, to uh, make uh, a piece of group uh, theory. So here, I'm going to, to, to try to explain to you how it can, be, it can work. So here, I write the phase matching relation, n minus over lambda 3 minus n plus over lambda 1 minus n minus over lambda 2 equals 0. It is, uh, I, I, I took the example of type 3 BPM in a negative uniaxial crystals. And so it is a corresponding phase matching relations. It is a uniaxial crystal, so we can uh, use the terminology ordinary and extraordinary waves. And so the minus wave is the extraordinary one, and the plus mode is the ordinary one. And here, I uh, drawn, uh, I plotted the uh, corresponding layer of the index surface. So it's an extraordinary index. So Ne uh, over lambda 3 is this ellipsoid. No over lambda 1 is a sphere. Ne over lambda 2 is an ellipsoid because it is an extraordinary index. Now here, you see some very strange animals. Uh, so G, G, J is J for group. And I, I have written here the symmetry group of these objects. These symmetry groups are not, don't belong to the 32 group of symmetry. The 32 groups of symmetry describing the 32 crystal classes are finite groups. But there exist also five infinite groups. Three of them are the sphere. It is an infinite group because you have an infinite, infinite axis. What is an infinite axis? You can turn uh, the object around this axis of, I don't know, 2.33 degree, uh, you are going to see exactly the same sphere. So it is an infinite axis. So a sphere, so it's not really a sphere or a, a tired sphere. And so you have infinite, an infinity of infinite axis. And you have, so it is the first group, another group, is the group of the cylinder. So you have one infinite axis, an infinity of plane containing the uh, infinite axis, and you have a mirror perpendicular to this uh, infinite axis. The group uh, of, of, of the cone, a cone like this, you have an infinite axis, an infinity of mirror containing the infinite axis, but no plane like this. A vector belongs to this group. You can turn E around itself. You have the same E at any time, okay? It belongs to this group. So here you have, sorry, is it, what is it exactly? Uh, yes. So here, it is the group of the, uh, so an ellipsoid belongs to the group of the cylinder. You have an, an infinite axis, an infinite mirror containing uh, the infinite axis. Uh, you have this plane, the xy plane, that is uh, uh, the mirror plane. The sphere, so here is, so we write this like this, infinite over M and an infinity of mirror. The group of the sphere, and one more time, the group of the ellipsoid. And using a group theory, uh, you can here find that when you have this 
relation, this equation here. This equation is represented by these objects, these topologies. And if you want to find the results, the topology of the results, the solution of this equation, so you have to make this intersection. So it is my uh, proposition to find the symmetry group of the solutions of such equations. And if you do that, you find that the group given by the intersection between the three groups, so you have to make, it's very simple, you, 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 you determine uh, the elements that are common to these uh, to these three objects, and what do you find? You find something like this. You find here a group which is a group belonging to the uh, cylindrical uh, group, and in the Wolf, uh, Wolf diagram, you have something like, uh, like this. So the symmetry of the phase matching directions, the symmetry group of the object, the topology of the phase matching Loki, this symmetry group is the group given by this intersection. Uh, so here it's a summary for all uh, the cases in uniaxial crystals. And in any case, we, uh, we find that we, we find always the same groups, so we find that for all the situations that we have the group of the cylinder for the uh, symmetry of the phase matching Loki. So now we know that for uh, biaxial uh, crystals, we know that we have, uh, I told you that yesterday, that we have five possibilities of junctions uh, of the principal planes, five uh, types of uh, morphology for the phase matching uh, cones. And uh, so in that case, so if we uh, do the same job than for the uniaxial uh, optical class, so now we, we work with these more complicated uh, surfaces. And if you do that, if you do the job for uh, uh, biaxial crystals, you find that the, in any case, you find the group MMM. -M -M. In that case, is a finite group. It's an orthorhombic group. So in the case of biaxial crystals, the solutions of this equation constitute a surface that belongs to the MMM symmetry group. And you can do that this night and not do that, but verify that these topologies belong to this group. Now, angular quasi phase matching. So uh, I uh, told you that uh, I, I, uh, I have shown uh, uh, this. Uh, configuration of QPM yesterday, and Marty also uh, evocated it uh, this afternoon. So angular quasi-phase matching is uh, uh, an interaction. You, 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 you are totally free, and you can propagate at any angle with respect uh, with the uh, grating vector. Here, the grating vector is along the uh, x uh, axis. And so, so I am not going to discuss about uh, the difference of model uh, we have, Marty and myself, uh, but we are very, very good friends. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we, we like to discuss, and so uh, uh, we have some, uh, it, it is our favorite uh, controversy, but, <laughs> uh, but in fact, our two models are, uh, are very uh, compatible. I believe it. And uh, <laughs> I am very optimistic. 
but we don't know to have the final story because we, we like to discuss so uh, together. Um, so in that case, if we are in a situation, and I think that it is an approximation of the model uh, that was uh, presented by Marty this afternoon, which is uh, a good model, and an approximation of this is to consider that all the waves, even if we have not in normal incidence, all the waves uh, can be considered in certain situations as collinear waves. And in that case, you see that uh, according to the direction of propagation, the effective grating vary. So you have an effective grating uh, which depends on the direction of the wave vector and so if you are in the y direction, the effective uh, grating is equal to infinity. And if you are in the x direction, you see that you have the uh, smallest value of the grating uh, period. And so it is like this that uh, so Majid uh, showed you uh, some nice results uh, using uh, such an APO. It's like this that by varying the effective grating, we can vary the phase matching, the quasi phase matching conditions, and then we obtain a tunability. We have the tunability like this. And we uh, have shown that, in fact, now it's exactly the same uh, thing uh, than for uh, birefringent phase matching. So you have also, so imagine, so you find all the direction for which you are going to verify these equations. So it can be easily uh, calculated. And we see that for the isotropic class, there is only one topology. For the uniaxial class, three possible topologies. And for the biaxial uh, one, there is one, two, three, four, five, six possible uh, topologies. So these are not cones of phase matching cones, but quasi phase matching cones. And we call that angular quasi phase matching uh, cones. And so one more time, group theory can help us. So here you have the analytical expression of the effective grating as a function of the uh, angle of spherical coordinates of the wave vector. So, so here is a grating, so you can vary the angle theta and phi. And here is one over the inverse of lambda because in, in this equation, it is one over big lambda, okay. So here we have written one over big lambda. So you have the uh, angular distribution of the grating, it is a curve like this. And you have here the angular distribution of one over big lambda, so this bilober uh, surface. And these two uh, topologies belong to uh, the group of the cone with the uh, infinite axis along the x axis. So it is an infinite, uh, an infinite group. And now we are going to make the same job than in the case of PPM. So we consider we are looking at the symmetry group of the angular distribution of the solutions of this equation. So we have to check the, to, to identify the, 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 the layer corresponding to each piece here, a sphere, because it's an ordinary, so a sphere, a sphere, a sphere, so it's a coupling between three ordinary waves, for example, and here, so you have the corresponding infinite groups, and here you have the groups of that, and we know when we calculate that we have something like this, we find in that case, in the case of type 5 AQPM, corresponding to this, we know that we have this, the cones, the AQPM cones, 
uh, has this topology around the x axis. And if you look at the symmetry of this, it is the symmetry of the cylinder, and you see that it is exactly, it corresponds exactly to the intersection between these one, two, three, four groups. It's marvelous, no? Isn't it? Another example, type 6, AQPM, you make the same job, and you find here, uh, I took this example because here we find a finite group M, 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 and here you have effectively, actually, uh, um, a symmetry M, M, M. So probably to see that, you will have to make, to, to draw the things uh, in a 3D. Okay, so here is uh, the uh, summary for the topologies in uniaxial crystals, uh, AQPM topologies in uniaxial crystals, so it's the same kind uh, of work. And uh, so uh, we made in uh, 2009, so we verify uh, that kind of things, measuring, and uh, Patricia will show you next week how to measure these AQPM uh, direction using a sphere. We cut a sphere uh, uh, inside the, uh, the pipeline. Here it was uh, an MGO pip doped uh, pipeline. And you see here the phase matching curves. So uh, if we take this, for example, it is a phase matching curve corresponding to second harmonic generation, the fundamental wavelength being 970 nanometers. And it is a theater plotted as a function of phi. So it is a cone like this. It, it, it joins the x, uh, z plane here and the x, y plane, no, yes, or the reverse. Uh, so here it is at uh, phi equals zero. So here it is in the x, y plane, x, z plane, and here it is in a x, y plane. It corresponds to this direction. And you, you, we change the wavelength. For 106, for example, we obtained this topology. So uh, the cone uh, is around uh, the, z, uh, the z axis. And this direction corresponds to BPM. Here we have a phase matching uh, also in Piplin, you can have phase matching, obviously. Obviously, you have quasi phase matching, but you can also have phase match by refringent phase matching because lithium noibate is, uh, uh, is uh, by refringent. Okay, same job. I'm not going to go to give you more details, um, but we can make exactly the same job for biaxial uh, crystals. And we find, one more time, so here, in any situation, we find MMM for uh, the topology of the uh, phase, uh, angular quasi-phase matching uh, Loki. Okay, so, uh, so we saw that uh, uh, groups theory uh, allows us to determine, to, 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 to anticipate the symmetry group of uh, the phase matching uh, Loki. One more time, it's a general way to work. Here it is applied to uh, optics, but it can be applied to anything where you have angular distributions of something. Okay, five points, effective coefficient versus BPM or AQPM Loki. So here, so it's a kind of a big summary of all the things. We know that it's very important to reach phase matching or angular phase matching. Here I write, uh, I, I, I took the case of uh, phase matching. So you have the phase matching relation written here. We know that these phase matching relations imposes the configuration of polarization. And we know also that 
from this, we know that we can build the light tensor. And this light tensor, so we can say that it is imposed by the phase matching uh, condi conditions. And now, if we look at the orientation symmetry, so we know that the orientation symmetry governs the form of chi 2. And here we have this final relation given the strength of the nonlinear coupling, which is the contracted product between the light tensor and the matter uh, tensor. And so, and one more time here, the job is not completely uh, finished, but we have to check the compatibility of symmetry between the light tensor and the matter tensor in order to define in which case we will have an effective coefficient that is equal to zero or, or not. And uh, here you have an example um, of, so here we have plotted the element in the contracted notation, you see. Uh, F24, F24 is F, Y, Y, uh, uh, Y, Y, Z, uh, and so on. And so if we plot here, we have plotted uh, the five field tensor coefficients corresponding to the five non-zero coefficients of the chi 2 matrix. KTP is, is an MM2 crystals. In the, uh, under klein minus assumption, you have five independent, uh, um, uh, 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 not in Kleinman. If you check second harmonic generation, so you have symmetry over the two last indices, and you have five independent coefficients, chi 2, 1, 5, 2, 4, 3, 1, 3, 2, 3, 3. And if Kleinman uh, applied, you have relation between this. So we don't speak about Kleinman here. And so here, if you plot these five coefficients, you see, uh, be careful, because the scales are not the same. So these coefficients, you see, the, the scale is on the right, are two or three orders of magnitude, two, order, uh, two orders of magnitude uh, smaller than uh, these two uh, elements. So you see here that F3, 1, 3, 2, and 3, 3 are two order of magnitudes smaller than F15 and F24. So that when you calculate the effective coefficients, so it, is, it can be approximated by F15 chi15 plus F24 chi24. It's a shame because in KTP, the biggest nonlinear coefficient is chi233. But chi233 is not solicited by the field tensors coefficients. So it's bad. And so it's why uh, QPM is very interesting, because with QPM, you have uh, the full freedom to choose the configuration of polarization you want. And so if you want to excite the highest nonlinear coefficient, you are going to work, for example, with, uh, to consider an interaction between three waves polarized along the z-axis. And by this way, you can excite chi 2, z, z, z. OK, so just to, to, to show you that this uh, uh, approach can, is also relevant for people who are going to conceive new nonlinear crystals. And probably Patricia will show you next week how we can use also this formalism to measure the nonlinear uh, coefficients. OK, and I will finish. So it's, it's marvelous, 10 to 10. I will finish with our very, one of our very last work, uh, the a last aspect where uh, the group theory, and we are going to see another law, Curie's law, one of the Curie's law, can help for the symmetry analysis of isotropic med media under strain. So here we have demonstrated how third harmonic generation can 
uh, allows us to study the symmetry of a fiber. So it's uh, uh, so so we are working with uh, third harmonic generation. Omega plus omega plus omega gives three omega. And uh, this fiber, so it's a nice fiber fabricated by Draca. It's a simple step index fiber, but not so simple because the core radius is very small, 2.19 um, microns. Um, the uh, step index is equal to 0.06. Um, and we worked with a long fiber, long for us, Usually, we, we, we are working with crystals, so one or two centimeters. So here, it is 64.2 uh, centimeters. So for us, it's enormous. And so these, uh, uh, this uh, fiber um, was designed to achieve uh, 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 the, 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 the phase matching at for uh, in order to generate in the green at 516.4 microns. So it's not exactly devoted to this. We wanted to have something a little bit different, like 532 nanometers, for example. But in uh, the real life, it gives this third harmonic uh, wavelength. And so, you know, because the fiber is isotropic, no birefringence, so we have, and uh, Professor Mio has explained to us uh, uh, today and yesterday uh, these things of modes, the importance of modes uh, for propagation. Uh, in the case of four wave mixing, for example, and so uh, for third harmonic generation, you have also the same, same concept. And in this fiber, we can have phase matching when the fundamental wave is in the LP01 mode. So it's a Gaussian, fundamental Gaussian mode. And uh, the third harmonic wave in the LP03 mode. So you have a principle and you have some uh, satellites. Okay. So this, uh, this uh, fiber um, so, uh, is uh, an isotropic uh, fiber normally. But we saw, in fact, that it has a, an, 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 an anisotropy. And uh, here, we made a very simple experiment, the fiber Polarizer, polarizer, analyzer, and so you can be with polarizer and analyzer, I am tired, uh, parallel or perpendicular. And if you rotate these, uh, and so if you have an isotropic medium, you never, uh, you have uh, no extension if you measure the transmission. But if you have a, a non-isotropic medium, you will have an extension. So we, we, we did this job and you, we had, we obtained here, so it is a transmission. So we make, the, for example, the measurement here for the, the, at 1.5 microns. So in the infrared, the fundamental. So for this experiment, it is not a non-linear experiment. It's a linear experiment. We measure the transmission of the optical fiber after a polarizer. And so we have here a perfect malus law. And we can identify, like this, the two neutral. You remember when we, we discussed about crystal optics yesterday? I, I, I spoke about uh, the two neutral uh, vibration uh, planes. And so here, by doing this experiment, we identify the, these, two, uh, these two planes. So with this, we know now that this fiber is not isotropic, but anisotropic. What is, uh, how is, uh, uh, is the uh, birefringence? For that, we made now third harmonic generation and we 
measured the uh, uh, spectrum of the third harmonic wave as a function of the orientation of the fundamental wave. And what we see, what we see here, so here you have three curves. So it is the third harmonic energy as a function of the third harmonic wavelength. It is a spectrum. We measure the spectrum of the uh, third harmonic uh, wave for three directions of the fundamental polarization. So here, theater equal 90 degrees. So it corresponds to this or this, I don't remember. The red curve for theater equals zero. So you verify here that we have 90 degrees. The two planes, two directions are perpendicular. And this is intermediate. And what do you see here? You see that the three spectra don't coincide. And why they don't coincide? They don't coincide because the refractive indices are not exactly the same. We, we know that we have anisotropy. And here, if we consider that the dispersion between, you see here, this, uh, this couple of nanometers, if we, 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 we make the assumption that the dispersion of N, uh, NY, so here NY and NZ, so we took X as the uh, direction, so it's completely arbitrary, we called X a direction along the fiber axis and Z and Y uh, in the transverse uh, plane. And so if we consider that the index we have uh, uh, do not vary over uh, uh, some uh, nanometers, we can estimate uh, that, so, so you, you, you have to make uh, some calculations, but we can estimate that the birefringence is equal to 9, 10 to the minus 5 in this fiber. And it's, it's probably a good, a good estimation. But unfortunately, it's not sufficient to achieve phase matching. OK, and so uh, here we have now we made a, a, a completely a fully exhaustive measurement when, you know, we vary the angle of the fundamental wave, polarization wave, and we measure, we analyze uh, using a polarizer, we measure the transmission of the third harmonic waves. So it's a little bit crazy, very systematic. And what we obtained, so here you have the third harmonic intensity as a function of the angle. So you see, we vary E omega, so uh, theta, theta omega in. So you see, you have seven degrees, 17, and so on, and so on, and so on. And we also measured the polarization of the third harmonic. And we find something which is completely crazy. So when you see that, you say, OK, it's time to go to bed. Uh, it's really time to go to bed. Uh, so it's the beginning of uh, this evocation. And um, so very complex behavior of polarization. So how can we have uh, the, 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 the final word of this story? One more time, groups theory. We make the hypothesis that we have a uniaxial medium. We don't know. We know that it is anisotropic. So it can be uniaxial or biaxial. Let's begin with the uniaxial hypothesis. And so one more time, the group of symmetry of this object, this fiber, is necessary the intersection of the group of the ideal isotropic fiber and the group of symmetry of the strain. And here, and so that, th this, though it's not according to group theory, it's according to one of the Curie's law. You put a piece of glass, uh, you, 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 you press a, 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 a piece of glass, you transform 
an, uh, an, the, the, an isotropic medium into a uniaxial medium because you have applied a uniaxial mechanical strain. In this, uh, in this fiber, we saw that the core is a little bit elliptical. And so it can be sufficient to induce that kind of mechanical strain. And if it's an ellipse, so uh, it belongs to uh, the cylinder uh, group here. And so uh, the mechanical strain has this, belongs to this infinite uh, group. So we are going to uh, translate this uh, group's theory uh, equation into uh, a topological equation. So here is the index surface of the isotropic medium. The uh, topology of the mechanical uh, strain. And then if you make the intersection, you obtain something which belongs to the infinite group of the cylinder. And so you, you, obtained, you obtained this. Okay, so it's compatible with group symmetry. And so we, we know that now we know how is oriented our, uh, the index surface corresponding to the uniaxial medium uh, under uh, strain. So if you do that, so now the, the job is not uh, finished. The lecture will be finished in a few minutes, but not these calculations. Now, so, okay, we know, uh, we, we know the group, and so we have to apply Neumann principle in order to find the uh, non-zero coefficients of the chi-3 tensor. So we do the job, and we, so when you have this, uh, you see that there are plenty, a lot of possible configuration of polarizations for third harmonic generation. And if you consider all the possible configuration of polarizations of third harmonic generation, O, 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 E, O, E, O, E, and so on, uh, and if you calculate the total uh, three omega intensity, you obtain this. And so we were completely astonished to see that we have a full agreement with, uh, with the measurements. Probably we were lucky, but it's probably not uh, a, a problem of luck or not. Okay, so it works very well, and so you will find details in this, uh, in this paper. It is the end, and I hope to see you in Grenoble, I don't know, uh, in a few months. Thank you very much.